director at the Minnesota Music Coalition, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our next workshop, um, talking about bystander intervention. And um, we're so glad that Yvonne can be here today with us. Um, so I will uh, turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, as, as Joanna should, said, I'm Yvonne Knoyer, and I've worked in sexual violence prevention for uh, probably about 20 years. So a lot of work in child sexual abuse prevention, but also in adult sexual violence prevention and also um, child sexual abuse prevention and college campus prevention. So um, it will help me if I have a sense of who's here. So if you are willing, even just for the introductions, would you turn your cameras on and then will you... Um, take a second to chat in just some basic information about yourself. So um, your name will pop up automatically or the name that's associated with your account will pop up automatically, but maybe tell us um, your pronouns, um, where you are geographically, kind of what your connection is to the Minnesota Music Con um, Coalition. Are you a, a member? Are you a, you know, a fan, a musician, kind of whatever is like how you want to be understood as being part of this group. And then if any of you are a part of the Minnesota Music Safer Spaces Initiative, if you could also just let me know that, that would be awesome. And I'm gonna guess we're gonna have people probably dropping in a little bit as well. So everybody familiar with chat and where to find it? Yvonne, I forgot to mention the Safer Spaces, Spaces Initiative. Do you want me to do that? <laughs> sure. Yeah, that would be okay. great. Um, well, you know, one of the reasons that we wanted to have this particular workshop um, at uh, the summit this year was because um, we have a group that's been forming and developing um, that kind of recently put a name to itself called the Minnesota Music Safer Spaces Initiative. Um, and we're really in learning and, and conversation stages of um, trying to figure out what our next steps are. Um, Yvonne uh, joined us in the, in the fall and winter um, to do focus group and survey work on um, what maybe our community needed. And, and so this group is kind of taking the next steps, thinking about code of conduct, um, thinking about, uh, or, or I should say, having some kind of conversations with other performing arts industries who are doing this similar work and learning what some other people have already done. And, um, and definitely wanted to also uh, get some proactive uh, training out into the universe, um, which is why we're doing this. So, um, yeah, great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, thanks for sharing who you are and for turning on your cameras and, and um, feel free to like, I know for some of us, our cameras take too much juice, but I, I love seeing your faces. So if you are willing to stay so I can see you, that would be awesome. Um, I am going to probably start um, sharing my screen here um, really quickly, in which case then we won't be able to see each other. Um, but you know, I, whenever I talk about sexual misconduct or sexual violence, sexual abuse, I always like to talk about the fact that we all know someone. You know, sexual violence, sexual misconduct is so per pervasive in our society and in our culture that even if we don't know, we do know someone who has experienced and we probably know multiple someones who have experienced it. So I want to put our time together in a broader context. So right now, culturally, we as a as a society are in the midst of a couple of reckonings. We've got the whole Me Too movement, um, which has gained a lot of um, steam in the last few years, but we're also in the midst of a racial reckoning. And um, this concept of bystander intervention is, is really important in both of those situations. And then we're also in a pandemic. So it's very, we're in challenging times, let's just say it. Um, in Minnesota, as Joanna mentioned, I did a focus group this fall and, um, you know, was just trying to get a sense of where the music community is around sexual misconduct. And, you know, what I heard was that it's, it's an open secret, like, it's like something people know is happening, know has happened. 
um, but that often the conversations are among um, cisgender women and uh, among non-binary people. So it is a conversation that is just starting to bring uh, men into the conversation. And this is what I heard. And then there was a sense of there being a cycle of a public allegation, followed by a bunch of outrage, followed by kind of it all falling off the radar until the next time it kind of comes up. And, and believe me, the music community is not unique in that. That's just, that is often how um, it, that, that is just often how it goes. I also want to talk about that, you know, chances are in, in this room and among the six of us, um, there's also the possibility that some of us have experienced sexual violence ourselves and or that, you know, we have behaved in inappropriate or harmful ways. Um, just again, given the statistics, given the numbers of people affected by this, I always just like to acknowledge that um, we come to this with a wide variety of um, our own personal experiences. Seeing when it will be good. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. There we are. Okay. Drop down. Um, I also want to, you know, talk about the context that's surrounding um, this gathering or the, our time together here right now. Um, again, I mentioned I was involved in this focus group, and one of the things I heard was that now, you know, kind of there was been this pause with the pandemic, and now is a time for us to reimagine, re build and repair. So people were really hoping to see this as a tipping point where we change how we respond to, how we um, address sexual misconduct and ideally move forward so that we're actually preventing it from ever happening in the first place. Um, I'm just sharing, Joanna had shared uh, some group agreements that I think are used in um, different types of situations. So I wanted you to see these um, as well. Um, and I, as she mentioned, this workshop falls within uh, an, an array of work that is being done that um, will be addressing other issues, probably including accountability. So I'm, I mentioned this because during the workshop, we're going to want to be sharing some actual um, situations. We're going to be doing some practicing about how do we talk about situations that concern us or that are, that are harmful, or we don't like. And so I want to, it's important that we try to use realistic situations, but I'm gonna ask you not to name names, not to get into super specifics, and not to use this as a time to call out individuals. So um, again, there are times and places for that. I'm just saying in this workshop, since our focus specifically is on prevention, um, I'm gonna ask that we don't do that. So. If anybody has any concerns about that or concerns about any of the group agreements, if you would um, go ahead and let me know, that would be awesome. Any, any questions, concerns, disagreements with the agreements? Okay. In, um, okay, well then I'm gonna assume <laughs> that we're gonna go, we can go, we can move ahead, so. So let's talk for a minute about what we mean by sexual misconduct. So I like to use this uh, kind of stoplight approach where on the one side, we've got red, a box of red that is illegal behavior. So these are things that are clearly illegal. Um, things like, I mean, rape, uh, sexually touching someone without their permission, um, sharing, uh, you know, nude photos from of somebody without their permission. So these are things where we have laws that say this is not okay. And if you do it, something bad is going to happen. You know, not really, but something, <laughs> unfortunately, not often, but it can, it can happen. You can be prosecuted for some of these behaviors. And then on the left side, the green side is appropriate behavior. So these would be things that we generally agree are okay, like high fives, that kind of thing. And so our focus today is going to really be on that center box, that concerning, inappropriate, harmful 
behaviors, because this can really cover a broad range of behaviors. And there's going to be some agreements about what falls into this category, but there's also going to be some places where, you know, maybe I'm more comfortable with people I don't know well hugging me, and that's something that makes your skin crawl. So some of this is um, personal, and then some of this is uh, a little bit more universal. Um, I wanted to mention that um, also in the concerning inappropriate and harmful behaviors are these are things that can be considered unwanted. So, you know, some behaviors you know, among consenting adults would be totally okay. But if this, um, if this is something that's unwanted, it falls then into that category of concerning, inappropriate or harmful. Um, Joanna mentioned that uh, the group is thinking, is beginning some work on a code of conduct. And I've done some work with the Minnesota um, theater community as well on, uh, this is, it can be really helpful if we have, as a community, you know, as a um, as an organization, if we have spent some time agreeing on what we consider to be um, behaviors that are okay and what we consider to be behaviors that aren't okay, because then we've got something to rely on more so than just our own personal opinions. Any questions so far? You can either just un unmute and ask or um, go ahead and chat something in. Okay. Um, so our, the workshop today is really gonna focus on that yellow box of behaviors and how each of us has the power to create the change that we're seeking where all people can enjoy their artistry free of harassment or abuse. The problem with behaviors in that yellow box is there's no authority necessarily that we can call to intervene. The, the yellow box is where we as a community, we as individuals in that community, we're the ones then who need to take action. We're the ones who need to speak up. We're the need, ones who need to disrupt or interrupt. So that's what we're gonna focus on today is hot, those situations where we're seeing something that concerns us and we need to then take action. I wanna talk about how our behavior is shaped by our environment. You know, we all know that we behave differently when we're in a coffee shop than we do when we're in a loud um, sp sports bar. You know, we just, we walk into it and we kind of pick up on signals about what's gonna be okay here and what's not gonna be okay, okay here. We also behave differently when there are formal rules. So like what we've been experiencing lately, if there's a clear sign that says, masks are required, we know what, how to behave. We know what we're supposed to do. Also, you know, if you know that if you come late to a performance and you're not gonna be seated to admission until intermission, you're gonna work a lot harder to get there on time. So these kinds of formal rules also shape our environment. But we also, a lot of our behavior is also shaped by reading what's going on around us. So we see how are other people acting? You know, like anytime you go into a new situation, you start a new job, you go to a new city, you know, you uh, start hanging out at a new place. Part of what you're doing, you know, whether you're aware of it or not, is you're, you're finding out sort of how does it work here? Like how do people behave? What kinds of things are okay? What kinds of things aren't okay? And so what are the social norms in this community? And all of this then helps to shape our behavior. Okay. Um, how many, well, it's, it's so hard. I can't see very many of you. So um, bystander intervention is a grow, it's a growing, um, I don't know, it's a gr growing movement really. And bystander in intervention, focuses on how each of us 
can play a role in defining what's okay and what's not okay by actively intervening when we see or hear someone acting inappropriate or harmfully towards someone else. So that's kind of what bystander intervention is, is about. It asks each of us as individuals to use our power to help shape our environment. It asks us to get involved, to call people out, and to interrupt harmful situations. Um, bystander intervention is about both preventing victimization and preventing perpetration. So as I mentioned on the slide, for a long time, prevention really focused on what people could do to stop themselves from being victimized. And we didn't focus on what I think is the person who's in the best place to prevent sexual misconduct. And we didn't focus on the person who is doing the harming. Bystander intervention is, kind, is built on some research with offenders um, that tells us a few things. So it tells us that oftentimes, I mean, you might've heard the word grooming, but people who are um, considering behaving in an inappropriate way often will test out the situation. So they're gonna try to see what they can get, a, uh, get away with. Um, they're gonna try to uh, you know, find out. They're going to test boundaries. And so these are things that we can we call warning signs. So these are behaviors that other people can see and that give us an opportunity to intervene. So they test the waters. The other thing they do is sometimes they set up the environment. Um, there's some really chilling um, research uh, with uh, young adults in college settings um, that kind of debunks the idea that, oh, it just happened. Oh, you know, we just got carried away um, by showing sort of the thinking that can go into creating an environment where it's going to be easier to take advantage of someone sexually than um, it would be otherwise. And that includes um, alcohol, um, targeting someone who maybe is less experienced or who might be flattered by their behavior. And so these are things that other people, I mean, we don't know what's going on inside someone's head, but what we can do is see like when someone is acting in ways that, you know, seem a little shady or that make us uncomfortable. And that gives us um, the opportunity to take action. So I am going to stop sharing for a second here because I want to see who's here and I want to see if anybody has any questions. Is what I, maybe you could turn your cameras on and nod, <laughs> nod to me for a second here. Um, so is what I'm saying kind of ringing, resonating with you? Does it make sense? Does it seem logical, reasonable? Okay, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, someone once described um, presenting like this is like when you feel like you're in a closet talking, talking, and you don't know if anybody can see you or hear you or what's going on. So, okay, now I'm going to ask you, so we're going to go back to that yellow box. Um, I think you can remember. So it's inappropriate, concerning, harmful behaviors. And take a minute and chat in um, something that... Um, Let's see here, what are my instructions? Chat in some, at least one specific interaction that you've either experienced, witnessed, or could imagine happening in the music community. So again, don't use names. You don't have to, you know, we're, this is not about outing anybody. Be brief, but think about those situations. You Maybe you just saw something or you heard about something and you're like, that doesn't seem right. Go ahead and chat that in because I, we want to use that for some of our um, our practice experiences or practice session.
maybe um, if it would be helpful if we had a few more. So either if people could come up with a second one, or if uh, those of you who haven't uh, contributed one could come up with one, that would be really helpful. Okay. Okay. Great. These are great um, examples, and we're going to come back to them um, in a second here. I'm just going to go through a couple of ways um, that we can interrupt in real time. Let's see here. Oops. Okay. So I'm going to start with some of the ways that we can um, intervene a little bit more directly. So these would be things we could do when we're just seeing something um, and we want to take action. Maybe we don't have time to think about like how we would actually have a conversation or anything like that. So um, one of the uh, things you can do is distract. So do something to cause a distraction. So if um, you know, if you're seeing someone, let's say there was an example of someone um, older is really kind of coming on to or getting really close to someone who's younger and we don't really know what's going on, we can interrupt that by distracting um, people. So things like um, you could spill your drink, <laughs> you could um, cause a scene, like, you know, just do something that's going to draw attention, you know, everyone's attention at to you and just give a chance for that situation to slow down a little bit. Um, you could say something like, um, there's a tow truck outside, is, is that your car? Just something to kind of distract the two people involved and the people around them from what is going on at that moment. So again, this is something that can be used in, especially in, I think, bars. It, it wouldn't work so great in a concert venue, that kind of thing. But if you're in a like a crowded situation, a bar party type of situation, um, that is often like a first thing that um, people are can consider doing that will interrupt what's going on. Um, you can also disrupt and this involves kind of going up to the people and talking to them, but not necessarily talking about what is going on between them. So a classic one is, don't I know you from somewhere? Or have we met before? You know, something like that. Um, you could ask a question, you know, what do you think of the band tonight? Or, uh, you know, I, you know, maybe they're wearing a t-shirt. Oh, I love your shirt. Where'd you get that? You know, just something that you're, you're just kind of taking a little bit of attention off what is going on between them. And it's also like a chance for you to get a little closer to the situation and kind of read what's going on. Another thing you can do is ask others to help. Um, I'm not sure if folks are familiar, but um, there have been a number of um, safe bar initiatives that have been um, kind of growing throughout the country. Um, there have been some in some of the, uh, especially often in college towns, where they are really engaging like bar staff, um, bartenders, people who are in venues to like learn about and understand how they can interrupt and how they can be a resource um, to other people. So if, if you were concerned, but you don't know the people and you wanted, you know, to maybe see if they, the, you know, like the person who's seems like they've had too much to drink needs help. Uh, one thing you could do is like engage bar staff in, in helping to take action. Um, I know that I'm going to, in my um, slides, there's a link to Men as Peacemakers, which is located up in Duluth, and they've done a bunch of work around training um, 
volunteers and staff for the homegrown festival just on this topic exactly sort of like how do we you know be prepared to intervene if we're seeing something that you know just seems concerning to us so those would be some of the distract disrupt and ask others to help are three of the sort of less direct ways that you could um, take action. We're going to spend a lot of time on speaking up, but in the meantime, let's go back to chat and let's think of a specific um, situation, like in response to the situations that we've got listed here, like what might be some ways that we could uh, intervene. Does that make sense? So let's, well, I, why don't we do it together as groups? So getting grabbed by audience members in the crowd. So if you're getting grabbed, if, so, if you see somebody getting grabbed by audience members in the crowd, what might be something you could do to just draw attention away from that or just to sort of stop that from happening? Any ideas? I think there, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll say I'm struggling a little bit. I'm thinking it's a little easier in this situation to think about what the person who's experiencing being grabbed could do. And it, that's one of the reasons why we're focusing on um, bystander intervention, because it shouldn't always be up to the person. Um, move through the crowd and get between them on your way. That would be, that would be something, I mean, something like even asking everybody to clap their hands because then hands would go up in the air and you, they couldn't be grabbing while they're clapping their hands. I mean, that would be something you could do just, um, you know, this is part of um, the workshop and part of thinking this through is it's always easier like afterwards to think of maybe things you might've been able to do. I mean, um, I, I don't know that this one always works, but I mean, we just saw a powerful example with the um, bystanders to Derek Chauvin murdering George Floyd. I mean, think there was, you know, someone could use a camera, you know, just if you, if you pulled out your camera and started taking pictures that might show, you know, like you don't have to be like looking like you're trying to document a crime necessarily, but just might get their attention, might make them think, oh, I don't want, you know, like here, I think I'm being sneaky. I don't really want this caught on film and it might change their behavior. So um, that would be something. So, um, okay, how about, uh, what could we do for the guy who seemed to always wait until a woman was really drunk near the end of the night to approach and start flirting? What would be a way that we could distract or disrupt 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 or ask others to help yep long time no see yep yep stage a fake phone call for him yep yeah, that would be a good one. Um, you could ask her, you know, ask the person, um, hey, are you ready to go? Um, do you need a ride? That, like that kind of thing. Um, or, you know, a lot of times um, women will use, oh, I need to go to the bathroom. Will you come with me? Kind of a thing just to kind of, you know, separate the, you know, uh, intervene in this, get, you know, sort of pull them apart for a second. Um, yeah. Great ideas. Our Uber is outside. Yeah. Yeah. So again, you know, the main thing is to just start to like think through in advance. You start, you, you know, what are some of the kinds of situations that you are likely to encounter and start to think about, okay, well, you know, what could I do? What could I do in this situation? In, you know, instead of, and, 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 I mean, for me, it's like priming, priming the pump. So I'm always going to be much, 
it's more likely to do something if I've given some thought to it ahead of time. If I've, you know, even if I've never experienced that exact thing before, having thought through a couple of things um, will make it that much easier for me. So that's what that that would be what I would really recommend. Okay. Now we're going to go back to the slides and talk a little bit about what it takes um, to take action. Oops. Okay. So I was just going to say, um, I think you know, I mentioned it once before, but again, one of the really challenging things about bystander intervention is that it's on us, you know, so that part is really, is, does, it can be really tricky. I think it is common for us to wish someone else would change and someone else would fix whatever the situation is. Um, and you know, it, it will take all of us because even when we have rules, even when we have codes of conduct, it still requires us to speak up when we're seeing something. So let's talk a little bit about um, what, um, what we need to take action. So part of it is we need to be clear about what is out of bounds for us. A lot of, um, when we get into modeling and practicing how to speak up, um, I'm gonna really emphasize I statements and speaking for yourself and from your own feelings and your own um, needs and values. Part of that is nobody can argue with our feelings. They can, you know, if I if I say I'm upset or I'm offended, you, they can't really argue with that with me. If I say you're a jerk or you know, something like that, that is something that they can argue with. So it's really important for you to just kind of get clear with yourself about what's out of bounds for you. Doesn't have to, there doesn't have to be group agreement on a behavior. I mean, if you are uncomfortable when an older guy is coming on to someone who's had too much to drink, that is, that is an opportunity for you to take action. You don't need to have a group decision that that's okay or not okay. You're, it's just out of bounds for you. And then you will approach it from that standpoint. Um, as I mentioned, we've had some really powerful examples of bystander intervention in the trial of Derek Chauvin for murdering George Floyd. And while they weren't able to prevent his murder, they made a huge difference in holding him accountable. So sometimes bystander intervention can sound like, oh gosh, I don't know if it really makes a difference, but it does make a difference. Um, I wanna talk for a minute about power and privilege. Um, you may know that the phrase Me Too was started by Tarana Burke, a black woman in 2006. And yet when Alyssa Milano used Me Too in 2017, media coverage exploded. It's unfortunate fact in our world that different people will be heard differently. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that not because we want that to be the way the world is, but to acknowledge that each of us has power in some ways and we need to figure out how we can use our power. And I, I bring this up particularly because it is, it how we're heard and how we're received will depend in, in some ways on how much power we're perceived to have. And I think that this, that in many ways, the harder it is for us to speak up. So speaking up to someone we know might be harder than speaking up to a stranger, speaking up to a friend or a relative, speaking up to someone who's in a position, you know, that, that we we're in a position of authority for. All of those can be really hard, but all of those are opportunities for us to use whatever power and privilege we have. Um, when we did the focus group this fall, we did a lot of talking about how it shouldn't be women and non-binary people calling out men all the time, that there should also be men who are calling out men. There should also be 
you know, established artists calling out established artists. There should be a recognition that, you know, we ha people have differing levels of power and we need people to use their power to create the kind of world that, or the kind of environment, the kind of music community where everybody um, is safe to perform, is safe to enjoy the, the you know, music, whatever. Um, okay. We're going to talk a lot about finding partners or allies. And as we've already talked about preparation and practice, because again, the more um, we have thought through how we might handle a situation, the more likely it is that we will not wake up the next morning and think, why didn't I say something? Why didn't I do something? Um, when I worked in child sexual abuse prevention, we did a a random digit dial survey where we like randomly called 500 households in the Twin Cities. And one of the things we asked was, um, we asked people if they'd had the experience of believing that someone they knew might be sexually abusing a child. And for everyone who said yes, we asked, what, if anything, did you do? And what we found were the vast majority of people did nothing. And I always say, we didn't none of us plans to be the person who does nothing. We don't like get up in the morning and think, oh, I'm gonna pretend I didn't see that or I'm gonna not do something. But what we need is this time to prepare and practice so that we can really um, be prepared and be effective when we're trying to take action, so. Okay. Um, how many of you have heard of Minnesota nice. Actually, I actually have a slide about it too. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the, the official Wikipedia definition of Minnesota nice is a cultural stereotype applied to the behavior of people from Minnesota, implying residents are unusually courteous, reserved, mild mannered, and passive aggressive. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, a, a little fun quiz here for you. So, in the chat. Um, so, when I'll say I grew up, I grew up in Wisconsin, but I have plenty of Minnesota nice in me. But I grew up in a in a family where, um, yeah we avoided conflict at all costs. It was my dad's favorite line was turn the page. It was just like, we're not, we're not going there. So, um, so I can relate. Um, in the chat, share where you are at on a scale of one to 10 with one equaling, I shouldn't even have to say anything. They should just know their behavior is out of line. I tried to use my Marge voice for that. <laughs> so one is I'm like, I, yeah. I should just be able to look at them and they would know that what they're doing is not okay. And then 10 means, here, I'll do another accent for you. I'm from the coast. I have no problem calling people out on their bullshit. Okay, so <laughs> from one to 10, where are you at? So just share the number. Nice, okay. Okay, great. Okay. I, I, I feel like I'm a, I'm not be a five, I'm aiming for six, seven or eight. I wanna get up on that side of the scale, so great. Okay, now we're gonna talk through, and I've got a handout for this one. So I'm gonna um, take one second to get the link up for that. Um, oops. Okay. I just um, put a link to a document and this is, we're gonna spend a chunk of time on this right now. Um, it's tips for talking about a situation or behavior that is concerning or inappropriate. So if you would go ahead and open that document, um, 
and then I'll walk us through it. And then we're gonna do some practice with it, okay? So this rec, this, um, the setup for this is, you, it's either something that you might be able to do in the moment you're seeing something that's happening, but it also might be something where you, um, it's you know almost like stage and intervention where you, it, it's, it's some, in, here we're assuming, if, if it's the intervention, we're assuming it's somebody that you might know, somebody that you um, could then come back to and talk to later. So it's, it's, it's a couple of those types of situations. So the first step is really try to find a way to connect to the person whose behavior concerns you so that you're, it can be as simple as, you know, great t-shirt, are you from Wisconsin? Um, it can be you know, we've been friends for a while and I care about you and that's why I'm bringing this up. It can be, you know, my other example is, did you see the Strib Me Too article a couple of weeks ago? It made me think that I'd want my friends to say something if they thought I was being inappropriate. That's why I'm talking with you about this. So we're gonna hear somebody that connects with us in some way more than we are gonna hear somebody who, um, you know, doesn't either, um, doesn't take, doesn't indicate that connection, if you know what I mean. So like, if I just were to like, you know, say, Ashley, when you did this, it really upset me, you know, go off da, da, da. it kind of start by connecting in some way and then move on to the content. So the next step is to describe specifically what you observed. And this is really important. Um, the more specific you can be, and the more you focus on things that you can actually observe, the clearer it is going to be for the other person. So again, here I came up with some examples. You know, I saw you put your arm around Lucy and she stiffened up immediately. So that would be something you could observe. You could see him put, the person put their arm around and you could see Lucy's response. I noticed that when you're drinking, you use a lot of sex, sexual innuendos when you're talking to other members of the band. That would be another example. The last two times we've played together, I've seen you buying drinks for and trying to isolate younger fans. So these are you know, things that you can see specifically. It's important to use I statements to focus on things that can be observed, to identify the specific behaviors that bothered you, and to be as specific as you can be about when this happened, where it happened, how many times it happened, that kind of thing. All of this will make it easier for, or it should say, make it harder for the person who you're talking to, to, dispute what you're saying because you know the if you're not in if you're not at it so so we get into the pitfalls it's when you start labeling somebody when you start diagnosing somebody when you start being really vague or when you are making blanket statements it's really it's really easy for someone to sort of say you don't know what you're talking about but when you're you know when you're able to say hey this is what i saw this is you know how i felt and you know, this is what I want from you, it's gonna be, it's gonna go so much better. So describing specifically what you observed. Any questions on that? Is it making sense? Okay. Um, the next step is to share how you were impacted. So again, you're gonna focus on yourself and how you felt. So my examples, I said, I felt uncomfortable and I worried that Lucy was also uncomfortable because she left right after that. So I'm saying I felt uncomfortable. I didn't say Lucy was uncomfortable because I don't know how Lucy was feeling, but I said, I worried that Lucy might've been uncomfortable. And then again, I described the behavior. So that you know, described what I saw. Um, I felt embarrassed and offended when I heard what you were saying to them. I was confused because we talked about how important personal safety is. And I thought we agreed that commenting on clothing or bodies is out of line in this situation. I'm worried about you. 
So those are all um, feeling statements, I feeling statements. So again, the tips are to own your own reaction. So I, this is what was going on in me. Um, this is what I was feeling. And then use feeling words. Um, again, it's, I keep saying that it's a little bit harder for someone to dispute how you're feeling. You know, they could say you shouldn't have felt worried, but they can't say you didn't feel worried if you were worried. So pitfalls, this is where it can get really tricky because a lot of times um, it's very hard to stay with feelings. We, we uh, a lot of times our thoughts will get disguised as feelings. So we'll say things like, I feel that you were out of line <laughs> or I feel um, that Lucy was uncomfortable. So you, you, uh, you shouldn't even have to use the word. You should just be able to insert the feeling after I, I and then the feeling. Sometimes catch yourself if you say, I feel X, you know, like I feel okay. Okay is not a feeling. Or, so that would be a good clue that you're not using a feeling word. The next step is to share what you need and or your values. Um, and this one is, um, it, I think it's just an important segue to asking for what you want, because it's saying, this is what happened. This is how I felt. This is what's important to me. And so examples like, I want this to be a safe place where everyone feels comfortable. So that's a, that's a statement of a need or my values. We've worked really hard to have everyone in the band feel comfortable with sharing their ideas and, and feeling like we're all on the same team. And I worry that your language might undermine that work. So you're saying it's important to me that we all feel like we can participate. I want all artists to be able to perform free from harassment. So that's kind of my value. I don't want people to misconstrue your behavior. And then enthusiastic consent is important to me. And when someone has had a lot to drink, consent gets fuzzy. So those are all examples of things where you're sharing what you need and or your values, what's important to you. And again, when you're sharing it, um, when you're owning what's important for you and you're using those I statements, again, it's, it's less about the other person. It's about you and what's going on with you. And, um, the, and, and I think that really um, sets it up, especially if some, with, if it's somebody that, you know, um, for them to understand where you're coming from. So pitfalls would be using impersonal pronouns like it really bugs me or that was out of line. And just like it's, again, as when we're getting vaguer, it gets a little bit harder. Or using evaluations and interpretations like you betrayed me when you did that. Um, betrayed isn't a feeling, it's an evaluation. It, and it's a word that carries a lot of weight. If you want people to be defensive and to argue with you, then use evaluation and interpretations, because that will just trigger, uh, often will trigger us in, in like defending ourselves. And then the next step is to make a specific request for a change in behavior. So example, would you be willing to ask Lucy before you show physical affections towards her? Could be something you could say, please stop making sexual innuendos to members of the band. Or I would like you to stop buying drinks for our fans on the nights we play together. Okay. So again, the more concrete and specific you are, the better. And it's ideal if you can identify a behavior that's observable. So sometimes we say stuff, we want to say stuff like, just be nicer. What does that even mean? Like, how would I know if I'm being nicer? Or how would you know if I'm being nicer? So we want to try to be as specific as we can be. Also, sometimes it's easy. We we end up talking about we don't what we don't want instead of what we do want. Like, um, you know, don't be a jerk. Don't don't be a douche. You know, whatever something like that. It's just it's better if we can be specific, um, and identify a behavior that is observable. Okay. Any I that I covered a lot, and I wanted to know if there are any questions before we go on and start practicing this. Okay, so here's what I came up with. So 
you're in a rehearsal break and everyone is standing around talking. An established member of the group says to a newer member of the group, great dress, bet you didn't go home last night. Okay, so that's our situation. You're a member, you're, you're one of the people who's in the rehearsal room, so you saw this happen. Um, and now we're gonna go through our uh, steps and try to think about what we can, how we can um, respond to this. Okay, so how, David, are you willing to be in a group? Do we do we want to go two group two groups of two, or how do we? Or do you want to try to do this all as a group? I think it's kind of good to wrestle with it on our own, <laughs> but in, I'm in okay to, to handle it however you want to. I have the breakout room set up right now, but I I'm not included, and Joanna is not included. Okay, okay, so, um, okay. However you'd like. Well, let's, okay, well, let's do it as a whole group. So, um, but I will ask each of you to really, really participate. And we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to, to role play. So, um, so everybody has a scenario, okay? And then I'm gonna go back and let's see here. Before I share my screen, actually, um, uh, how do I undo that? There we are. Does everybody have access to the handout that I shared? Or would it be better if I put up a slide that has just the basics of the, the five steps? Preference there? I think it would be best for a slide just because that way we can kind of see each other and I don't have to pull up a document and okay. not look at you guys. Yep. Good, okay, I'll go ahead and do that. There we are. Okay, present. Okay, so these are the, again, the five steps. So. Um, I'm going to go to the instructions next, and then I'll bring this slide back up. So we're all going to use the same scenario. So that actually is good. We're going to get to see some different ways that we would all handle it. So what I want you to do is take a few minutes on your own to prepare your thoughts. So like, because I'm going to ask each of us to, um, to role play how we would actually, you know, what we would actually say. So take a few minutes to jot some notes. Uh, I'll put the other screen screen up in a second. And then we're going to choose one person to go first, and then we're going to debrief that, and then another person debrief, another person will just each get a chance to try it. So it's, I know that role playing is challenging, but it's super important because a lot of times what we think is going to happen doesn't happen when it's actually words coming out of our mouths. <laughs> so it's good to practice. So I am going to put the screen up here and go ahead about five minutes for that it's been five minutes how are we doing do we do we need more time or are we feeling ready okay i'm gonna assume we're ready okay does someone want to volunteer to go first I will. Um, Thank you, David. <laughs> of course, I tried to remember specific examples of each of the steps. So it's good if I miss something, I'll learn something through this experience. So that's good. All right. Hey, so nice solo on our new tune. Uh, I did see that you made a comment to our new sax player that felt slightly inappropriate to me. I feel upset that this kind of language was used in our own rehearsal space. And I would like to ask that you refrain from these types of comments in the future. Okay, great. So let's go through it, go through it. I, I heard the connection really clearly. So let's kind of walk through it step by step. 
Yep. Just so we can. Sorry, there we are. So, first sentence. Uh, nice solo on our new tune. Great. Yeah. So nice way to connect. Okay. Yep. Then next. Uh, I said, I saw you make a comment to our new sax player that felt inappropriate to me. Okay. So um, caution. Um, I think it does help if you can be really specific. So like, you know, when you said great dress and then kind of hinted that they didn't come home last night, you know, so again, just kind of like, so we we're getting clear on like what exactly we saw. So, sure. yeah. And then I felt uncomfortable. That was, yeah. So then you got into the feeling. Yep. So, yep. Okay. I, I feel upset that this kind of language was used in our rehearsal space. Yep. Great. And then, and I would like to ask that you refrain from these types of comments in the future. Yep. Great. Good job. So how was that to work on that? How was it? Did you feel comfortable, uncomfortable? Um, it felt comfortable um, for the most part. I feel like if I were to see something like this in my own band, let's say, I would feel like it was, you know, my responsibility to to say something and, and confront somebody um, or intervene, I suppose, is a better word. Great. So, yeah, it felt good. Good. Great. Yeah. yeah. That's great. And yeah, it's all, and it sounds like there's like to you, that's just a part of leadership. It's like, yeah, if I'm in, this is important to me. So I'm going to speak up when I see something. Yeah. Exactly. Great. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you want to go, Ashley? Yeah, I can go. Okay. I, I, um, as I was thinking through this, I was considering the different roles that I have in my organization and how I might approach it. So if it was a band that I didn't know or wasn't directly affiliated with, I might stand by for a minute and just watch for a bit as the situation plays out, just because that I wouldn't want to make the situation worse for the new member. And I'd also want to know if other band members would step in and say something. Mm -hmm. If no one did, that would be the point in which I'd pull the individual aside um, I was kind of wondering about that because in that situation, I was wondering about the feeling part of it because we don't necessarily have a relationship and I'm not sure that they, I'm thinking about like from when I work with young individuals that especially young individuals that I don't know, don't necessarily care if I feel uncomfortable. So the, the approach that I had to it was a little bit more like, this is, this is what I said. Hey, I don't mean to intrude, but I was, I was hearing, or I overheard your conversation. And I might say that it made me uncomfortable when you said, um, the way that your dress, that, that your other members dress looked. And I was just going to reinforce then like our, our venue policy, which would be, um, in our venues, we try really hard to make our spaces safe and, that felt like, um, and that's maybe where I do a feeling like that made, um, that's as far as I got. So, but your comment about their clothing made, um, is not tolerated by our policies or procedures on keeping our spaces safe. Mm -hmm. There's something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it was an individual directly that I knew, and that was in one of my programs, I would be checking in with both individuals um, pulling the first individual aside and having a similar conversation. And that's when I would do a, I felt uncomfortable by what you said. And I have the, I'm under the impression where I feel as though um, the other individual feels similarly or had left with some sort of feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I also check in with that person just because they're also within my jurisdiction of what I do and make sure, sure that they're also okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So on the, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a, a great point about um, like 
yeah, we want our words to be effective. So if, like, if, you know, like if you being uncomfortable, like wouldn't really have influence on a person, then I think, yeah, it's, it's good to think of other words. I mean, a few things that came to mind for me were like, I worried that she might've felt uncomfortable or I worried that, um, you know, this contributed to an unsafe feeling or, you know, just so you could, again, it can like, I own it's you who worried about that. Or I worried that, that um, I'm trying to think of other words. So uncomfortable is one worried would be one. Um, I mean, you could go another route, complete route. I was surprised. I, I haven't really heard you talk like that before. So it took me aback, you know, so again, it's just keeping it on like kind of what is going on within you. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and again, I mean, I really appreciate because um, Joanna knows how strongly I feel about policies and practices, you know, like workshops and expecting us all on our own to do this is, is, is a lot. And it is so much easier if we can just say, hey, you know, remember, our policy is X, Y, Z, that doesn't meet our policy, please change your behavior. You know, that is so much easier than you having to say, this is what's going on inside of me. So great, great. Um, Carol, are you, would you be willing to share? Yes, sure, hold on a sec. Um, okay, yeah, that was a very interesting scenario. My partner's listening off screen too, and we were kind of going back and forth about how we would do it. And we were kind of approaching it from like, we were band members and, and, and the, the so we're, we know the senior member of the band like better than the, the junior member that he made the comment to. So we're trying to think of it from that point of view and how to kind of like diffuse the situation, but also make him like a little bit aware of what he was doing. And we, uh, my partner said that sometimes like when she's heard somebody say something inappropriate, she'll be like, oh, can you explain that? And having like something that they said, they're kind of hoping to get away with. Like you said, they were testing the waters to see how far they could go with this new band member, maybe like having to actually explain it. Like most people are not like, I like sexually harassing people. So they would sort of get embarrassed and try to come up with a different reason that they said that. So, you know, our, our scenario comment was something like, Oh, I don't understand. What can you explain what you meant by that? Like, huh? Is that like a is that a thing? And kind of make it humorous. Like, so it's is it like a dress code thing? Like, where do you where do you like measure when somebody uh, is definitely going home not alone? You know, like I'd love to know. Like, is it a you know? And just kind of like make the person kind of like explain it and maybe feel a little awkward and not quite as uh, dominant or whatever he's trying to feel in the moment. Great. I, that, I, that is a great example of like looking at the context uh, in the situation and then, yeah, diffusing it a little bit, you know, differently. It's just similar to, you know, a lot of times as a strategy people use when people make racist comments. It's like, oh, what did you mean by that? Yeah. <laughs> Where are you going with that? You know, just we like... Were we were talking about like, we wouldn't really want to like say, I think that's inappropriate because then the junior band member might feel under pressure to be like, oh no, it's cool because they're trying to obviously like get to a, a good position within the band or whatever. So yeah. it's almost like leaving her out of it, not making her make a stand on it at all. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's a great point too. And I, and I think that I didn't say that specifically, but yes, it would be the time this, in this situation, I think you're, it's going to be more effective if you talk to the established member separately from the, you know, like not in the midst of the whole group. So um, your suggestion was, a, is a good way to just say something right away, gets across the message, kind of like, mm, mm, we heard what you said, that cool. And then you, you, it could be something where if it, if it was necessary, you follow up later, you know, with some more specifics, but yes, um, I think a down, side of, um, not a downside, but uh, something to keep in mind with bystander intervention is we don't know, like, where the other person is at. I mean, we don't know, I mean, if, if the behavior is welcome or not. So we're just, we're, again, that's why we're focusing on, on how we feel about it. Um, but yeah, we don't want to, like, jump in and assume something and, you know, like, or put the person on, on the spot in a way that then makes it even more uncomfortable for them. Mm -hmm. So they might, they might 
not want to share, they might have stepped away for a few minutes. So, okay, we have about 10 minutes left here. So, I mean, if you want, I could put up another scenario. I mean, is this, well, before I do that, any questions, any comments, any, anything you want to share with me, any questions, stuff like that, anything? Do you want to do another scenario? You can nod your head. You can recede if you're like, no way. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> I wouldn't mind another scenario just for the sake of we're going to be taking this back to our venue staff to train. Okay. Sure. Some scenarios could be helpful. Okay, great. Um, so I picked one. Okay, here I'll draw, I'll drop it in. So again, in your situation, like if if um, if the exact situation doesn't fit, do as you did before and sort of adapt it to your own organization. So I, again, I'm this one is sort of assuming we're in a like a liquor selling establishment. So what is who is so here I used did one that has a physical aspect to it. So. One of the artists who's performing next signals to waitress and when the waitress brings their drink, they slap them on their butt. So that's the situation. You saw this happen. So take like three minutes and see if we can come. I'll put this context, the context, the screen back up. Here we are. Okay, are we feeling ready? Okay. Who wants to go first? You take it from the top again, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I said, hey man, super excited to see your set. It's been at least a couple of years since I've seen you play last. I did want to mention, I saw you slap the waitress's butt during our set break. I feel surprised that you did this and um, I didn't finish here, but um, I'd say something like, and this venue is the type of space that we'd like to keep this behavior out of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So surprised and um... Yeah, I kind of took the approach of like, you know, a venue is a community space yeah. and it's, there's no place for this kind of behavior there. Yeah. 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 I mean, in some ways she's just trying to, they're, they're just trying to do their job and they don't need us like people touching their bodies or something. Yeah. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Great. You want to go then, Ashley? <laughs> I was going to say, I can go in my venue. This one would actually be relatively easy. We have a zero tolerance policy. That person's <laughs> out, even if they're a band member. Okay. So, yep, they'd be kicked out right away. And, okay. yep. and, and if it was a situation like they were just about to go on stage, um, I'm not sure exactly how we'd handle that. It has happened before we, where we have kicked someone out who has been a member of a band for it, but also because we are in all ages. So we have people as young as 13. Mm -hmm. So as part of that mandated reporting and stuff, so that he or this individual would potentially play their set and we would be in the process on our staff end of filing a police report to get them out. So okay. that would be our situation in this one. Um, if it was in a different venue space, where there might be alcohol. And um, that would be the other thing too, is that the wait staff would also be considered our staff too. So um, I would have a similar approach to David's approach. So in a different context, but in the context in which I work, it would be like that person's gone. So yeah. yeah. Again, this is where policies are so helpful. You know, just that it's very, very clear. Like we have a, yep, we have a hands-off policy or whatever, yeah. How about you, Carol? Do you want to share? Sure. Um, 
So this time, I guess you said to make it relevant. So I worked through it from like a fan scenario, like an audience member scenario. So that's where I would be in that situation. And um, I worked through my outrage responses first. And then I, um, my partner and I came up with one where it was more like going up to the merch table afterwards and being like, you like, you guys are my heroes. Like, I love your music so much. Like, so it, it really, really bummed me out when I saw you do that, you know, to that waitress. Like, I love the waitresses at this bar. I love this bar, you know, and I hate to see them get like bothered on their, on their work shift. Yeah. Great. Just something like that. Like something minor to just kind of like make them feel uh, my first reaction was like, I'd go to the manager. I'd go, you know, like, but then it's like, well, maybe like you were saying, like just somebody, saying something to the person would have more of a long-term impact on them versus them just getting banned from a club or whatever, if, if that would even happen, which it probably wouldn't. So. Right. Right. And yeah, you don't know if this is the first time they've tried that or if this is like a long-standing pattern, you know, the, and so, yeah, just, and again, it's you're owning it. Hey, you know, this bummed me out. I, you know, this is not what I expected from you. I mean, that I think is powerful. So Yeah. Yeah. Coming from an artist's perspective, that's super powerful. Mm. And I think your way of connecting with the band at the merch table is really impactful as well. And mm -hmm. showing that you value the venue in that way is also really impactful and would probably resonate pretty uh, heavily with the artist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, because it gets in that kind of that, like, we're all in this together. Like, we all, yeah, we want, we all want to have these kind of spaces available, be able to do our, you know, do our stuff. So mm -hmm. um, I'm going to just pop up the slides again and share a couple of additional resources. And then I can, um, actually, why don't I drop in um, a link to the slides so that you if you have any interest in the slides themselves, you would have those. And, and. So they're bo both the slides and the um, tips are Google Docs. So you could just access them that way. And then I just wanted to share a couple of resources before we uh, um, back to present. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Minnesota Theater, Laura Stearns and, the, um, and a bunch of people are creating some um, uh, standards for the theater community. And this has been something they've been doing as a process. And it's something I think that just will be um, important for everyone to be looking at. So they've spent some time on that. So that's a resource. And these are hyperlinks, so you can pop to that. I mentioned Men as Peacemakers and their best party model. They're the folks who do the training for the Homegrown Festival up in Duluth. Hollebeck is more of a street harassment, um, but they do they have a lot of free resources. So if you're looking for stuff on, um, you know, just other ideas for how to intervene. And then I just shared the Center for Nonviolent Communication. They, um, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, I've just found their work super helpful for um, getting clear, especially about what you're feeling, what your needs are, and what you're asking of other people. It's It, it would be a super deep dive um, for people, but I found their, their work to be super helpful in just being clear on what it is we're wanting from other people. So, um, I would recommend them as well. So uh, I really appreciate you taking this time this afternoon to on a, one of our most beautiful days in Minnesota to do a workshop. So I really appreciate that. Um, and oh, I didn't leave here. I'll just put my contact information into I didn't do that. Um, but feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions or there's a situation you want. I mean, I'm you know, within reason, the situation you want to work, talk through with me. Um, there we go. So Yvonne Canorian is just my name at gmail.com. And Joanna knows how to reach me as well. And so um, I think I'm going to be doing some work with the, um, the um, group that's going to be working on safer space, the safer spaces initiative for the Minnesota Music Coalition too. So I'll be in touch with folks that way as well. So any parting thoughts? Okay. Otherwise, Just, again, thank you so much for being here. This was great. Oh, oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, okay.
Bye. Take care. <laughs> you guys too. Take care.